The greatest hero of Greece was Hercules. He was a personage of quite another order from the great hero of Athens, Theseus. He was what all Greece except Athens most admired. The Athenians were different from the other Greeks, and their hero, therefore, was different. Theseus was, of course, bravest of the brave, as all heroes are, but unlike other heroes, he was as compassionate as he was brave, and a man of great intellect as well as great bodily strength. It was natural that the Athenians should have such a hero, because they valued thought and ideas as no other part of the country did. In Theseus, their ideal was embodied. But Hercules embodied what the rest of Greece most valued. His qualities were those the Greeks in general honored and admired. Except for unflinching courage, they were not the, those that distinguished Theseus. Hercules was the strongest man on earth, and he had the supreme self-confidence magnificent physical strength gives. He considered himself on an equality with the gods and with some reason. They needed his help to conquer the giants. In the final victory of the Olympians over the brutish sons of earth, Hercules' arrows played an important part. He treated the gods accordingly. Once, when the priestess at Delphi gave no response to the question he asked, he seized the tripod she sat on and declared that he would carry it off and have an oracle of his own. Apollo, of course, would not put up with this, but Hercules was perfectly willing to fight him, and Zeus had to intervene. The quarrel was easily settled, however. Hercules was quite good-natured about it. He did not want to quarrel with Apollo. He only wanted an answer for, from his oracle. If Apollo would give it, the matter was settled as far as he was concerned. Apollo on his side, facing this undaunted person, felt an admiration for his boldness and made his priestess deliver the response. Throughout his life, Hercules had this perfect confidence that no matter who was against him, he could never be defeated, and facts bore him out. Whenever he fought with anyone, the issue was certain beforehand. He could be overcome by only by a supernatural force. Hera used hers against him with terrible effect, and in the end he was killed by magic, but nothing that lived in the air, sea, or on land ever defeated him. Intelligence did not figure largely in anything he did, and was often conspicuously absent. Once, when he was too hot, he pointed an arrow at the sun and threatened to shoot him. Another time, when the boat he was in was tossed about by the waves, he told the waters that he would punish them if they did not grow calm. His intellect was not strong. His emotions were. They were quickly aroused and apt to get out of control, as when he deserted the Argo and forgot all about his comrades and the quest of the Golden Fleece, in his despairing grief at losing his young armor-bearer, Hylas. This power of deep feeling in a man of his tremendous strength was oddly endearing, but it worked immense harm, too. He had sudden outbursts of furious anger, which were always fatal to the often innocent objects. When the rage had passed and he had come to himself, he would show a most disarming penitence and agree humbly to any punishment it was proposed to inflict on him. Without his consent, he could not have been punished by anyone, yet nobody ever endured so many punishments. He spent a large part of his life expiating one unfortunate deed after another and never rebelling against the almost impossible de demands made upon him. Sometimes he punished himself when others were inclined to exonerate him. It would have been ludicrous to put him in command of a kingdom, as Theseus was put. He had more than enough to command himself. He could never have thought out any new or great idea as the Athenian hero was held to have done. His thinking was limited to, to devising a way to kill a monster which was threatening to kill him. Never, nevertheless, he had true greatness, not because he had complete courage based upon overwhelming strength, which is merely a matter of course, but because by his sorrow for wrongdoing and his willingness to do anything to expiate it, he showed great greatness of soul. If only he had some greatness of mind as well, at least enough to lead him along the ways of reason, he would have been the perfect hero. He was born in Thebes and for a long time was held to be the son of Amphitryon, a distinguished general. In those years, early years, he was called Alcides, or descendant of Alcaeus, who was Amphitryon's father. But in reality, he was a son of Zeus, who had visited Amphitryon's wife, Alcimena, 
in the shape of her husband when the general was away fighting. She bore two children, Hercules to Zeus and Iphicles to Amphitryon. The difference in, in the boy's dis, descent was clearly shown in the way each acted in face of a great danger which came to them before they were a year old. Hera, as always, was furiously jealous, and she determined to kill Hercules. One evening, Alcamena gave both the, the children their baths and their fill of milk and laid them in their crib, caressing them and saying, Sleep, my little ones, soul of my soul. Happy be your slumber and happy your awakening. She rocked the cradle, and in a moment the babies were asleep. But at darkest midnight, when all was silent in the house, two great snakes came crawling into the nursery. There was a light in the room, and as the two reared up above the crib, with weaving heads and flickering tongues, the children woke. Iphicles screamed and tried to get out of bed, but Hercules sat up and grasped the deadly creatures by the throat. They turned and twisted and wound their coils around his body, but he held them fast. The mother heard Iphicles' screams and, calling to her husband, rushed to the nursery. There sat Hercules laughing, in each hand a long, limp body. He gave them gleefully to, gleefully to Amphitryon. They were dead. All knew then that the child was destined to great things. Tiresias, the blind prophet of Thebes, told Alcimena, I swear that many a Greek woman, as she cards the wool at eventide, shall sing of this your son and you who bore him. He shall be the hero of all mankind. Great care was taken with his education, but teaching him what he did not wish to learn was a dangerous business. He seems not to have liked music, which was a most important part of a Greek boy's training, or else he disliked his music teacher. He flew into a rage with him and brained him with his lute. This was the first time he dealt a fatal blow without intending it. He did not mean to kill the poor musician. He just struck out on the impulse of the moment without thinking, hardly aware of his strength. He was sorry, very sorry, but that did not keep him from doing the same thing again and again. The other subjects he was taught, fencing, wrestling, and driving, he took two more kindly, and his teachers in these branches all survived. By the time he was 18, he was full grown, and he killed, alone by himself, a great lion which lived in the woods of Cetherian, the Thespian Lion. Ever after, he wore its skin as a cloak, with the head forming a kind of hood over his own head. His next exploit was to fight and conquer the minions, who had been exacting a burdensome tribute from the Thebans. The grateful citizens gave him a as a reward, the hand of the princess Megara. He was devoted to her and to their children, yet this marriage brought upon him the greatest sorrow of his life, as well as trials and dangers such as no one ever went through before or after. When Megara had borne him three sons, he went mad. Hera, who never forgot a wrong, sent the madness upon him. He killed his children and Megara too, as she tried to protect the youngest. Then his sanity returned. He found himself in his blood-stained hall, the dead bodies of his sons and his wife beside him. He had no idea what had happened, how they had been killed. Only a moment since, as it seemed to him, they had all been talking together. As he stood there in utter bewilderment, the terrified people who were watching him from a distance saw that the mad fit was over, and Amphitryon dared to approach him. There was no keeping the truth from Hercules. He had to know how his, this horror had come to pass, and Amphitryon told him. Hercules heard out. Then he said, And I myself am the murderer of my dearest. Yes, Amphitryon answered, trembling. But you were out of your mind. Hercules paid no attention to the implied excuse. Shall I spare my own life then, he said? I will avenge upon myself these deaths. But before he could rush out and kill himself, even as he started to do so, his desperate purpose was changed and life, his life was spared. This miracle, it was nothing less, of recalling Hercules from frenzied feeling and violent action to sober reason and sorrowful acceptance, was not wrought by a god descending from the sky. It was a miracle caused by human friendship. His friend Theseus stood before him and stretched out his hands and clasped those blood-stained hands. Thus, according to common Greek idea, he would himself become defiled and have a part in Hercules' guilt. Do not start back, he told Hercules. Do not keep me from sharing all with you. Evil I share with you is not evil to me, 
and hear me. Men great of soul can bear the blows of heaven and not flinch. Hercules said, Do you know what I have done? I know this, Theseus answered. Your sorrows reach from heaven, from earth to heaven. So I will die, said Hercules. No hero spoke those words, Theseus said. What can I do but die, Hercules cried. Live? A branded man for all to say, Look, there is he who killed his wife and sons. Everywhere my jailers, the sharp scorpions of the tongue. Even so, suffer and be strong, Theseus answered. You shall come to Athens with me, share my home and all things with me, and you will give to me and to the city a, a great return, the glory of having helped you. A long silence followed. At last Hercules, Hercules spoke slow, heavy words. So let it be, he said. I will be strong and wait for death. The two went to Athens, but Hercules did not stay there long. Theseus, the thinker, rejected the idea that a man could be guilty of murder when he had not known what he was doing, and that those who had helped who helped such a one could be reckoned defiled. The Athenians agreed and welcomed the poor hero. But the thing out of all he could only feel. He had killed his family. Therefore he was defiled and a defiler of others. He deserved that all should turn from him with loathing. At Delphi, where he went to consult, consult the oracle, the priestess looked at the matter just as he did. He needed to be purified, she told him, and only a terrible penance could do that. She bade him go to his cousin, Eurytheus, king of Mycenae, of Tyrans in some stories, and submit to whatever he demanded of him. He went willingly, ready to do anything that could make him clean again. It is plain from the rest of the story that the priestess knew that Eurytheus was like, and that he would beyond question purge Hercules thoroughly. Eurytheus was by no means stupid, but of a very ingenious turn of mind, and when the strongest man on earth came to him humbly prepared to be his slave, he devised a series of penances from which from the point of view of difficulty and danger could not have been improved upon. It must be said, however, that he was helped and urged on by Hera. To the end of Hercules' life, she never forgave him for being Zeus's son. The task Eurytheus gave to him to do are called the labors of Hercules. There were twelve of them, and each one was all but impossible. The first was to kill the lion of Nemea, a beast no weapons could wound. That difficulty Hercules solved by choking the life out of him. Then he heaved, heaved the huge carcass up on his back and carried it to Mycenae. After that, Eurytheus, a cautious man, would not let him inside the city. He gave him his orders from afar. The second labor was to go to Lerna and kill a creature with nine heads called the Hydra, which lived in a swamp there. This was exceedingly hard to do because one of the heads was immortal and the others almost as bad, inasmuch as when Hercules chopped off one, two, two grew up instead. However, he was helped by his nephew, Aeolus, who brought him a burning brand with which he seared the neck as he cut each head off so that it could not sprout again. When all had been chopped off, he disposed of the one that was immortal by burying it secretly under a great rock. The third sacred labor was to bring back alive a stag with horns of gold sacred to Artemis, which lived in the forest of Cernithia. He could have killed it easily, but to take it alive was another matter, and he hunted it a whole year before he succeeded. The fourth labor was to capture a great boar, which had its lair on Mount Eurmanthius. He chased the beast from one place to another until it was exhausted. Then he drove it into deep snow and trapped it. The fifth labor was to clean the Aegean stables in a single day. Aegeus had thousands of cattle and their stalls had not been cleared out for years. Hercules diverted the courses of two rivers and made them flow through the stables in a great flood that washed out the filth in no time at all. The sixth labor was to drive away the Symphalian birds, which were a plague to the people of Symphalus because of their enormous numbers. He was helped by Athena to drive them out of their coverts, and as they flew up, he shot them. The seventh labor was to go to Crete and fetch from there a beautiful savage bull that Poseidon had given Minos. Hercules mastered him, put him in a boat, and brought him to Eurytheus. 
The eighth labor was to get the man-eating mares of King Diomedes of Thrace. Hercules slew Diomedes first and then drove off the mares unopposed. The ninth labor was to bring back the girdle of Hippolyta, the queen of the Amazons. When Hercules arrived, she met him kindly and told him she would give him the girdle. But Hera stirred up trouble. She made the Amazons think that Hercules was going to carry off their queen, and they charged down on his ship. Hercules, without a thought of how kind Hippolyta had been, without any thought at all, instantly killed her, taking it for granted that she was responsible for the attack. He was able to fight off the others and get away with the girdle. The tenth labor was to bring back the cattle of Gerion, who was a monster with three bodies living on Eurythia, a western island. On his way there, Hercules reached the land at the end of the Mediterranean, and he set up as a memorial of his journey two great rocks, called the Pillars of Hercules, now Gibraltar and Cuda. Then he got the oxen and took them to Mycenae. The eleventh labor was the most difficult of all so far. It was to bring back the golden apples of Hesperides, and he did not know where they were to be found. Atlas, who bore the vault of heaven upon his shoulders, was the father of the Hesperides, so Hercules went to him and asked him to get the apples for him. He offered to take upon himself the burden of the sky while Atlas was away. Atlas, seeing a chance to be relieved forever from his heavy task, gladly agreed. He came back with the apples, but he did not give them to Hercules. He told Hercules he could keep on holding up the sky, for Atlas himself would take the apples to Eurythius. On this occasion, Hercules had only his wits to trust. He had to give all his strength to supporting that mighty load. He was successful, but because of Atlas's stupidity rather than his own cleverness. He agreed to Atlas's plan, but asked him to take the sky back just for a moment so that Hercules could put a pad on his shoulders to ease the pressure. Atlas did so, and Hercules picked up the apples and went off. The twelfth labor was the worst of all. It took him down to the lower world, and it was then that he freed Theseus from the chair of forgetfulness. His task was to bring Cerberus, the three-headed dog, up from Hades. Pluto gave him permission, provided Hercules used no weapons to overcome him. He could use his hands only. Even so, he forced the terrible monster to submit to him. He lifted him and carried him all the way up to Earth and on to Mycenae. Eurythius very sensibly did not want to keep him and made Hercules carry him back. This was his last labor. When all were completed and full expiation made for the death of his wife and children, he would seem to have earned ease and tranquility for the rest of his life, but it was not so. He was never tranquil and at ease. An exploit quite as difficult as most of the labors was the conquest of Antaeus, a giant and a mighty wrestler who forced strangers to wrestle with him on condition that if he was victor, he should kill them. He was roofing a temple with the skulls of his victims. As long as he could touch the earth, he was invincible. If thrown to the ground, he sprang up with renewed strength from the contact. Hercules lifted him up and, holding him in the air, strangled him. Story after story is told of his adventures. He fought the river god Achilles because Achilles was in love with the girl Hercules now wanted to marry. Like everyone else by this time, Achilles had no desire to fight him, and he tried to reason with him. But that never worked with Hercules. It only made him more angry. He said, My hand is better than my tongue. Let me win fighting, and you may win talking. Achilles took the form of a bull and attacked him fiercely, but Hercules was used to subduing bulls. He conquered him and broke off one of his horns. The cause of the contest a young princess named Dianara, became his wife. He traveled to many lands and did many other great deeds. At Troy he rescued a maiden who was in the same plight as Andromeda, waiting on the shore to be devoured by a sea monster which could be appeased in no other way. She was the daughter of King Laomedon, who had cheated Apollo and Poseidon of their wages after, at Zeus's command, they had built for the king the walls of Troy. In return, Apollo sent a pestilence and Poseidon the sea serpent. Hercules agreed to rescue the girl if her father would give him the horses Zeus had given his grandfather. Lamaudin praised, promised, but when Hercules had slain the monster, the king refused to pay. 
Hercules captured the city, killed the king, and gave the maiden to his friend, Telamon of Salamis, who had helped him. On his way to Atlas to ask him about the golden apples, Hercules came to the Caucasus where he freed Prometheus, slaying the eagle that preyed on him. As Hercules had sworn to do while he was Omphali's slave, no sooner was he free than he started to punish King Eurythes because he himself had been punished by Zeus for killing Eurytus' son. He collected an army, captured the king's city, and put him to death. But Eurytus, too, was avenged, for indirectly this victory was the cause of Hercules' own death. Before he had quite completed the destruction of the city, he sent home where Dianara, his devoted wife, was waiting for him to come back from Omphali in Lydia, a band of captive maidens, one of them especially beautiful, Lola, the king's daughter. The man who brought them told to Dinar told her that Hercules was madly in love with this princess. The news was not so hard for Dinar as might be expected because she believed she had a powerful love charm which she had kept for years against just such an evil, a woman in her own house preferred before her. Directly after her marriage, when Hercules was taking her home, they had reached a river where the centaur Nessus acted as ferryman, carrying travelers over the water. He took Dianara on his back and in midstream insulted her. She shrieked and Hercules shot the beast as he reached the other bank. Before he died, he told Dianara to take some of his blood and use it as a charm for Hercules, if ever he loved another woman more than her. When she heard about Iol, it seemed to her the time had come, and she anointed a splendid robe with the blood and sent it to Hercules by the messenger. As the hero put it on, the effect was the same as that of the robe Medea had sent her rival, whom Jason was about to marry. A fearful pain seized him, as though he were in a burning fire. In his first agony, he turned, to, turned on Dianara's messenger, who was, of course, completely innocent, seized him and hurled him down into the sea. He could still, still slay others, but it seemed that he himself could not die. The anguish he felt hardly weakened him. What had instantly killed the young princess of Corinth could not kill Hercules. He was in torture, but he lived, and they brought him home. Long before, Dianara had heard what her gift had done to him, and had killed herself. In the end, he did the same. Since death would not come to him, he would go to death. He ordered those around him to build a great pyre on Mount Oida and carry him to it. When at last he reached it, he knew that now he could die, and he was glad. This is rest, he said. This is the end. And as they lifted him to the pyre, he laid down on it as one who at a banquet table lays down upon his couch. He asked his youthful follower, Philoctetes, to hold the torch to set the wood on fire, and he gave him his bow and arrows, which were to be far famed in the young man's hands, too, at Troy. Then the flames rushed up, and Hercules was seen no more on earth. He was taken to heaven, where he was reconciled to Hera and married her daughter Hebe, and where after his mighty labors he has rest. His choices prize eternal peace within the homes of of blessedness. But it is not easy to imagine him contentedly enjoying rest in peace or allowing the blessed gods to do so either.